truly wonderful to see each and every one of you with us here this morning for our time period of worshiping our Heavenly Father. As was mentioned earlier, we do have some of our own number who are not able to be with us today, but in their place we have several visitors. We want you to know that as always, you are our honored guests, and we invite you to come back at any opportunity that you may have. If you see something or hear something that spawns a question within your mind, don't hesitate to give us an opportunity to sit down and to answer the question, to study with you from the Word of God. Throughout the course of this year, we have been engaged in a series of lessons looking at the question, what does the Bible say about? This morning, we're going to address the question of what does the Bible say regarding or about Holy Spirit baptism? Holy Spirit baptism. There is much to be said within the religious world regarding Holy Spirit baptism. A lot of different ideas regarding it. Some religions believe that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is received by the one who is saved and therefore being a sign that they are saved. Others may not go quite that far but believe that the Holy Spirit baptism is, matter of fact, one reference that I have says that it is a once-for-all act whereby Christ places believers in the care and safekeeping of the Holy Spirit until the day He comes. But exactly what does the Bible say about Holy Spirit baptism? Someone says, well, is that really relevant to me today? And the answer is, well, yes, as all Bible knowledge is relevant to every Christian. So that we might better understand and appreciate what we read here and be able to, in our studies with others, be able to give a right or an accurate representation of what the Word of God has to say. The first thing we'll look at, though, when we talk about what does the Bible say about the Holy Spirit baptism, is the promise. We have to go back in the Bible and look for the promise regarding the coming or regarding the coming of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. In Mark chapter 1, verse 8, we find here that John says, I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. John, who is preparing the way for Christ, he told them that I baptize you with water, but one who is coming, whose shoes I am unworthy to unlatch, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So that's kind of the first promise that we see regarding this. But then we look at some promises made by Jesus. Turn in your Bible, if you would. Let's start with John chapter 14. Jesus is sitting here with his apostles. And in John chapter 14, beginning there in verse 26, here's what he says. Actually, let's start in verse 25. He says, These things I have spoken to you while being present with you. But the Helper... The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. So Jesus here is making the promise to his apostles that the Holy Spirit would be sent and would teach them all things and would bring into their remembrance all things that Jesus had taught. Now let's turn one chapter over to chapter 15, beginning there in verse 25. Here in John 15, beginning in verse 25, we read, But this happened, that the word might be fulfilled which was written in the law. They hated me without a cause. Now verse 26, he says, But when the Helper comes, who I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, will pro the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me, and you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning." So here Jesus says that this Holy Spirit, this Spirit of truth, would testify of him. And then in John 16, beginning there in verse 7, he says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you, but if I depart, I will send him to you. Now notice in verse 8. He says, and when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. He says, of sin because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Now observe in verse 12. He says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. 
For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. The apostles heard two messages during this setting of 14, 15, and 16. The one message is, I've got to die, that Jesus was soon to die. But the second message was that I'm leaving. He's going up into heaven. And they did not want to be left alone, nor did he want them to be left alone. So he promised to them that the Spirit would come. And the Spirit would make certain that they were fully equipped to teach the message into the world. But now let's jump forward or turn over to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, Luke's account, he records this last discussion between Jesus and his apostles. And notice with me here, beginning in verse 44 of Luke 24. Jesus says to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things may be, must be fulfilled which were written in the law of the prophets, and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the Scriptures. Remember, going back to John 16, he says, There's many other things that I want to teach you, but you can't handle it. You're not ready for it. But when I go, the Spirit, the Spirit of truth would be sent by Christ, would be sent by the Father. Well, after his death, but just before his ascension, he opened their understanding so that they might comprehend the Scriptures. Then he says to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remissions of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and you are witnesses of these things. Now... Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Just before sending up into heaven, he says, you need to wait here. You need to wait for the power from my Father. Now turn over to Acts. Acts chapter 1, Luke, who is the writer of the book of Luke, as well as the book of Acts. Look here in Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now, the reason why I read Luke, this portion, Luke, or Acts, 8, Acts 1, verses 4 and 5, it's kind of a retelling of what we read at the tail end of Luke chapter 24. And in this, he says, you wait. You wait here. For what purpose? What did he say in verse 5? He says, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So all these promises have to do with that event whereby the Holy Spirit would be sent by God, would be sent by Christ for a very specific purpose. And the question is, what was that purpose? Well, let's look at this. Remember what we read a while ago in John chapter 14, beginning there in verses 25 and 26. It was the responsibility of the Holy Spirit to guide them into all truth. Now someone says, well, the apostles, they were taught by Jesus. Did they not have all truth? They had some, but not everything. He had given them the fundamental principles that would be the foundation for the new covenant. But there were some things they could not understand until after his death. They would not be able to understand until the Holy Spirit came down and did two things. He reminded them of all the things that Jesus taught, but he also taught them all things that they would need to teach. And through their teaching, the Holy Spirit would testify of God. Through the various miraculous gifts that would be performed, it would testify of the authority of God, and it would convict the world of sin of righteousness and judgment to come. So when we look at the purpose of the Holy Spirit, it was this baptism of the Holy Spirit was to guide the apostles unto all truth. But there's another purpose to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It enabled the Word of God to be delivered to the apostles through a miraculous means. Be turning with me to Acts chapter 2. I remember when I was a young person... I did okay in school. I just was not overly bright like the overly bright kids were. You know, I, I, did, I did okay, and I ended, I ended up graduating as part of the, the Beta Club Society. 
Someone said, how did you do that? It was pretty easy because my junior year, I took all easy classes. And so my, because I was nearly done, and so my senior year, same easy classes. So I got an A by default because everything was so easy. And it wasn't math and science. I was done with all those, thankfully. So, yes, here's where I was going with that. Not being overly bright. There were times where I took tests in school, and I just wished, I wished there was some way that I could learn this stuff a lot better. You know, you can't cheat, that, that'd be wrong. So there was a study that I remember reading where they said if you would record on a cassette tape, because we used those back then, if you would record on a cassette tape what you wanted to remember and play it while you slept, it would help you to remember it better. No, it didn't. Or the tapes weren't long enough. The apostles... They didn't learn the truth that they learned by studying. Now, bear in mind, many of them, and especially Paul, studied the Old Testament. But the things that they were taught, they were taught by Christ and further taught by the Holy Spirit. How, we don't know. It just happened, and they knew what they needed to teach. Even Paul makes, certain, or makes it clear that the things that he learned, he didn't learn from the apostles, the other apostles. He learned from the Holy Spirit. So the knowledge that they had was brought to them, given to them, through miraculous means. Let's start there in Acts chapter 2. And um, what I'd like to do is read verses 1 through 4. I know I've got verses two, or 5 through 8 up there, but let's go ahead and read the first four verses. Because this is the promise fulfilled. When the day of Pentecost had come, fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then they appeared to them, divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, this was the fulfillment of the promises that we read. The Holy Spirit came upon them in a, in a form and a manifestation that was clear and evident that something wonderful was happening and something different, something non-natural or unnatural, if you would. But then we start in verse 5 there. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. That's significant to understand. That for the Pentecost, you had Jews, men from all throughout the region there, having traveled here to Jerusalem for Pentecost. And he says in verse 6, And when they heard this sound, or when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused, because everyone heard them speak in his own language. So here we have it, and, and some hold the contention that the miracle was on the part of the hearer. I don't, I don't hold to that position. I believe the miracle was on the part of the apostles speaking in tongues, speaking in language they had not learned, but language that was understandable. Understandable because it was a natural language that men spoke. It would be, the equivalent would be if God gave me the ability to come before you and speak in Russian without me ever having learned it. That was the gift of speaking in tongues. They were able to speak in other languages, and these people heard it. And they were confused, they said in verse 7, and amazed, I should say, look, are not all these who speak Galileans? How is it that we hear each of them, or each in our own language in which we were born? And then verses 9 through 11, he lists several nations that were represented here. So what happened was, is God delivered this message to them through a miraculous means. Not only did he lay upon them, if you would, the message that they were to preach, but also through a means and a measure that caught the attention of everybody. In Acts chapter, um, Acts chapter 2, verses 7 to 11, we mentioned this in reference. Consider, you had these individuals who were hearing the apostles speak in their own language. In other words, this apostle was speaking whatever the language of the Parthians were. This one over here, he was speaking in the language that the Cappadocians spoke. Now, they all spoke Koine Greek. It's kind of like a common language, like our English is. But this apostle over here, he was speaking to them in a, in a, a language that those from Pamphylia were able to understand. In verse 11, we hear them speaking in our own tongues 
the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Of course, there were a few people who mocked it, but others were saying, what does this mean? What is this purpose of this great event? Now, one thing to note, that there were instances where speaking in tongues were continued to be used as a part of evangelism, as a part of teaching. And we won't go into this very much. It is something that we'll show a little bit later was going to cease and did cease. It was not uh, the language of angels where people could not understand it. If there was someone of that native tongue present, they could understand it. It was, according to 1 Corinthians 14, used in worship service, but it was for a very specific purpose. It was as a display of the power in hopes of teaching the one that did not believe, but if there was no interpreter present, then they were not to exercise that gift. It would be of no benefit if nobody could understand. So this is what the purpose of it. The purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit was to bring to the apostles all the truth and through a means and a, and a manner that would be a demonstration of the power of God and the authority of God and to also serve as a witness of Jesus Christ. Notice with me in John chapter 15 there. We read this while ago, but we'll read it again very simply. John chapter 15 there in verse 26 there. He says there in John chapter 15, he says, But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from me, he will testify of me. So the Holy Spirit was going to testify of Jesus. It's the reason why the Holy Spirit was being given. So that those who would be taught the truth would be taught it in such a manner and means whereby they would be convinced of the authority of this speaker. But we're not done yet, though. There were a few more purposes to the gift, to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 15, verses 7 through 9, the Holy Spirit here, the instant when it came upon Cornelius' household, which, by the way, was second of only two occurrences of this baptism of the Holy Spirit, here Peter, in talking about that event, he reminds the people of its purpose. He says in Acts 15, verse 7, And when they had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. <clears throat> so God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us and made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. So when we think about the baptism of the Holy Spirit <clears throat> came upon the apostles and it came upon Cornelius and his household, a very specific instance in Acts chapter 10. When we consider this, we find that the purpose of it was very specific. The purpose of this was to make certain that the world would know, in this case in point, that the Gentiles were subject to the gospel's call, pardon me, <coughs> and that the message came from God and that the message was complete. It was all the truth that needed to be taught. As a matter of fact, Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 or 2 verses 1 through 4 tells us that this miraculous event was for the purpose of confirming the words that were being taught. Notice with me in Hebrews chapter 2 beginning there in verse 1. In Hebrews chapter 2 and what I like to do beginning in verse 1 and we're going to read down through verse 4. Looking back over my charts, I realized, or my outline, I've completely skipped the instance of Cornelius' baptism. So go back and read Acts 10, 44 through 48. That's the second occurrence of that, but we won't backtrack to that now. Notice in Hebrews, 10, Hebrews 2, beginning in verse 1, he says, Therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things we pray, lest we drift away. Now note this, For if the word spoken through angels prove steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward. Now here's the point. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. So, one of the purposes of the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the subsequent gifts that were laid upon people by the hands of the apostles 
was for the purpose of confirming the word. When you and I sit down and we study with an individual, we can say, well, open your Bible too. And here's what Jesus said. And we can tell them, well, the Bible says this, and they can say, prove it, say no problem. Here's what Jesus said, it's right here. But back then, they were still in the process of teaching the gospel into the world. And unless it was an Old Testament scripture, they were unable to open something. The letters had not yet been written and circulated and used to that end. So how would a person know whether or not this man called Peter or this man called Paul was teaching the truth? It was by the various miraculous gifts, and in this case in point, the things that were enabled by the baptism of the Holy Spirit of the apostles so that people might believe. Now John in John 20, verses 20, or 30 through 31, he makes this point. And talking about the works of Jesus, he says, there are many other things that Jesus did. But these have been written so that you may believe. These things that Jesus did were written so that you may believe. The things that Jesus did were done so that people might believe. Now, turn with me to, to the book of Mark, chapter 16. This same promise, this same purpose, is seen in Mark, chapter 16, beginning in verse 17, the very thing we've been talking about. He says, And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached every word, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. All of these signs that were done were done to confirm the word. And they all began on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles. Now one thing we, we must keep in mind about this is that all of these instances of the Holy Spirit coming upon the apostles, that all of these in, are more to the point the baptism of the Holy Spirit came from heaven. While the apostles would later, through the laying on of hands, give various gifts of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit that occurred only twice in the New Testament came from heaven and not from men. Now, we've talked about the promise, we've talked about the purpose. Someone says, well, shouldn't we still have a purpose, a need for the baptism of the Holy Spirit today? Well, if it worked that way, that would be really good. I mean, we've talked about this before. If it would be possible to go down and heal everybody in the hospital, call the news agencies and then go to another hospital and do that, we would think to ourselves, well, surely if we could do that, would it not teach the world? And the answer is no. People still would not believe. Think about all the things that Jesus did and the number of people who did not believe. Think about all the things that Peter and Paul and James and John and all the apostles did and the various acts and the miracles that were done to confirm the word. People still did not believe. I guarantee you, if God still used those means to confirm the word today, people would not believe. Someone says, well, what are we supposed to do? Well, don't worry about it. The thing is, this has already been confirmed, and that's the point. Every miracle that was done in the Old Testament Every near miracle that was done within the New Testament all confirmed the word. There's no longer a need. There's no longer a need for confirmation. Think about what Peter wrote in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Peter makes the point in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, and we need to, to lay heavily upon this. He says, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. God has given us all things we no longer lack. There's no question that is so important that God needs to answer through some miraculous means. All questions that we have that are pertinent to our salvation have been answered. Jude chapter 1 verse 3. Jude tells them to earnestly contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. The record of the miracles in the Bible, they serve as a continual and an ongoing confirmation of the Word of God. There's no longer a need for the baptism of the Holy Spirit 
because we have the Word of God now. There's no longer need to be a manifestation of the Holy Spirit through miraculous means to confirm the Word because the Word's already been confirmed. Paul, though, makes a very good point in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, beginning there in verse 9, regarding the ending or, or the ceasing of all miracles, not just the baptism of the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, let's read there in verses 9 through 10. He makes a point, he says, For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. Now, as you continue looking at this, he's making the point that a time will come where prophecies will cease, where speaking in tongues will cease, where the various of miracles, look at verse 8 there, whether they are prophecies, they'll fail. Whether they're tongues, they'll cease. Whether there's knowledge, it will vanish away. That time was coming. And the time is. The time was reached where it was no longer necessary to speak miraculously and to act miraculously in order to know and to explain the Word of God. That time was past when the Word was given in the completeness that we have it. Peter was confident that God had given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Paul was confident that God had breathed out all scriptures that were necessary to be beneficial to doctrine, reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16 and 17. And Jude was confident that all faith had been once for all delivered to the saints. Now, if they were wrong, then we are wrong. And in what do we put our faith? But if we believe that what they said was right and accurate and truly the Word of God, then we follow nothing else but what we have here. One interesting footnote to consider. Paul wrote to the Ephesians somewhere around A.D. 64. And I want you to notice in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, a statement here made by the Apostle Paul. In Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 4, he says, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Now, as of A.D. 64, the Apostle Paul wrote, there's only one baptism. So the question is, which was it? He doesn't say there are two baptisms baptism of the Holy Spirit, and baptism taught by Jesus Christ. He doesn't say there are three baptisms, the baptism taught by John, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and the baptism taught by Christ. He says there's only one. So we ask the question, well, how do we know which is the one that we're to be teaching today? Some teach the Holy Spirit baptism is the one. They look at Acts chapter 2, verse 38, where Peter says, repent, be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. They say that's Holy Spirit baptism. All right, 1 Peter 3, 21, they'd have to say that's Holy Spirit baptism. Mark 16, 16, it's Holy Spirit baptism. But what is interesting is when you study the Scriptures, you find that there are only two references to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2, Acts 10. And there are a number of passages to water baptism. You think about it. We have them on the chart there behind me. But we can start in Acts 2 and look at the 3,000. Those who gladly received his word were baptized. Verse 41, in that day, 3,000 souls were added unto them. You can look at the case in point of Ethio, of the, of the uh, we'll come back to him in a minute. Look at the case in point of the Philippian jailer. Look at the case in point of Saul of Tarsus, who the Ananias said, Why tarriest thou arise and be baptized, washing away your sins? Lydia and her household, they believed and were baptized. The jailer and his household, they believed and they were baptized. The, the brethren, the people there in Corinth, they were baptized. The twelve men that had been taught by Apollos, when they learned the truth, they were baptized. But someone says, But John, how do you know that this is water baptism? and not Holy Spirit baptism, because that is the contention of many. One passage we don't have up here, because this was taught while Christ was still living. He does tell Nicodemus in John 3, verses 3 and 4, that unless a man is born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. I had a Calvinist one time admit that that is referencing baptism, that the water there is baptism. But when you look at Acts chapter 8, 
in the case in point of the man from Ethiopia. We talked about that a week or so ago. In that case in point, after being taught by Philip about Jesus Christ, beginning with Isaiah 53, he comes to some water and he says, See, here's water. He doesn't say, See, there's the Holy Spirit. He says, See, here's water. What does hinder me from being baptized? It's one of the greatest examples in the New Testament because with this singular example, it reassures us that every instant of obedience to the command to believe and be baptized was always and always and always water baptism. There was a book years ago, I think I've referenced this, I probably should have bought it, it was a little bitty paperback book and used bookstore, that tried to prove that the reason why water baptism was necessary is that the only way to get the Holy Spirit was in the water. And I looked at that and kind of thumbed through it and just didn't make much sense. I decided not to spend my 50 cents on it. I probably should have. It might have been useful at some point. But, but some hold that contention. That, and he, this guy was holding the point that the reason why the eunuch had to get down into the water because that's the only way to receive the Holy Spirit. The problem is it's not taught. It's nowhere taught in the Bible. The baptism of the Holy Spirit really did happen. It happened to the apostles, and the Holy Spirit came upon Cornelius and his household for a very specific purpose. It was truly promised by Christ, and it was truly fulfilled by heaven, not by man. And it truly served to deliver the word and confirm the word today. But it was, it's done. Its purpose was fulfilled. And so now, what we teach is what Paul teach. There's only one doctrine. There's only one Lord. There's only one faith. There's only one baptism. And that is water baptism. Water baptism that does not stand alone, but water baptism that is obeyed in conjunction with belief. Jesus said, Mark 16, 16, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. The same water baptism that is seen in connection with repentance... Acts 2, verse 38, Peter told the people to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. Water baptism in connection with, with repentance. Water baptism in connection with belief. Water baptism, which was an appeal unto God for a good conscience. 1 Peter 3, 21, he says, Like in the days of Noah, where eight souls were saved by water, he says, And the like figure were into even baptism doth also now save you. It's not the putting away the filth of the flesh. There's nothing special about the water. The water could stand still. The water could be running. The water could be, could be clean as clean could be, or it could be dirty. It doesn't matter as long as it's obedience to the gospel's call. Remember, remember Nicodemus? When he was told by Elisha's servant what you needed to do to go dip seven times in the river Jordan, he said, look, the rivers of the Abana and Farpar River, are they not much better? He only was cleansed when he dipped the seven times in the river Jordan. There was nothing special about the water. There was nothing special about the number of times except for the fact it was exactly what God had said. And obedience to that brought the physical cleansing of his body, and the obedience unto Christ's command today will bring the spiritual cleansing of sin from your life. If you're subject to the gospel's call and invitation, you're ready now to become a child of God. Come forward as we stand and as we sing.